Welcome to Women's League Reads, which is an educational program that is a member benefit of the Women's League for Conservative Judaism. We feature notable works of literary fiction that have been recently published, and, a, and we hold conversations with authors about four times a year. I'm Vivian Lieber, Women's League Reads Chair. Before we begin, I'm going to make a little plug for the Women's League Convention coming up in July, July 12th to 15th in suburban Chicago. Books and authors will very much be part of it. And we will have a, uh, some fabulous programming all throughout the convention. Our convention librarian, Rachel Kamen, will present the best new Jewish fiction at a special breakfast. We'll also, she will also moderate an author's panel about women's journeys through book, through literature. Please visit wlcj.org convention for much more information and thank you. Now I'm very much delighted to introduce you to Talia Karner. For the next hour, we'll hear all about her fifth novel, the third, which is called The Third Daughter, published in 2019 by HarperCollins. Here's a copy of the book. She also has uh, published four books um, previously, Hotel Moscow, Jerusalem Maiden, China Doll, and her first work of fiction, Puppet Child. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about her. Talia has had several careers before she began to write fiction. She was the publisher of Savvy Women, Savvy Woman, a magazine, and was lecturer at international women's economic forums. She has been a marketing consultant to Fortune 500 companies and also a volunteer counselor and lecturer for the Small Business Administration. She has also been a member of the United States Information Agency Missions to Russia, teaching women there entrepreneurial skills. Since she began to write fiction in 2002, her five novels have been hailed for exposing society's ills and have won multiple awards. She is a committed supporter of global human rights and has spearheaded projects centered on female plights and women's activism. She has given over 300 keynote speeches and presentations about the social issues that are behind each of her novels, giving these speeches to civic, educational, and religious organizations. Her psychological suspense novels expose indignities and atrocities long ignored. The Third Daughter is perhaps her most daring story yet and touches closest to home, I think, as, as its subject is a great injustice, unfortunately committed by Jewish men against Jew, young Jewish women for the most part. The novel was named a finalist in the 2019 National Jewish Book Council Awards in the book club category. She has also published short stories, articles, and personal essays. Ms. Connor is an active board member of Hadassah Brandeis Institute, the Jewish Women's Research Center at Brandeis. She's also an honorary board member of several anti-domestic violence and child abuse intervention organizations. She was born in Israel and is a seventh generation Sabra. Ms. Connor received her bachelor's degree from Hebrew University in Jerusalem in psychology and sociology, and a master's degree in economics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. She's married to Ron Connor, the former president of Maccabi USA. They live in New York, Florida, and have four grown children. I believe they're all daughters. And like no, her, three girls and one boy. Oh, okay. So it's delightful to meet you, Talia, finally. We, well, thank um, you. Thank you so much for having me and for featuring the third daughter. It's such an honor to be here tonight. Thank you. Part of the Women League Reads. Okay. We are going to try not to give away the ending of the novel because some people on this have not finished it. Some people are midway. Some have, some haven't. So it's a very exciting book. Um, I want to ask you first, um, you drew heavily from the story of Tevya and his family. 
just to get some of the characters drawn, just to, to launch the, the novel. And, uh, but not exactly so. Batya was completely different from any of Tevye's daughters. But the parents and other sisters who are absent from the story, they're kind of behind the scenes, the sisters, uh, except for one of them. They do resemble Shalom and Lechem's characters. Uh, we immediately understand certain things about them because of that, icon those iconic characters and the iconic story. Even um, her father, Kapol, is a little bit, is a lot like Tevi in many respects. Is that why you adopted parts of the Shalom Aleichem story for their familiarity? The reason was not so much because of their familiarity, but because I was inspired by Shalom Aleichem and his short stories, and particularly one that got me going about this subject, and that is called The Man from Buenos Aires. That short story is about one of those kind of a character that we get to know later on in my novel, The Third Daughter, a man who is well healed and very well behaved and looks good and dresses well, who travels from Buenos Aires to Russia, supposedly to find a virtuous bride. And instead, he, what he does is a completely different story. So Shalom Aleichem introduced us to that character, the man from Buenos Aires. And it appears in the same collection of stories where Tevye's stories appear. And because of that, the connection, they are all, they are considered, uh, they are called the railroad stories. Because of that, I thought of a Fiddler on the Roof production, which is one particular adaptation of Fiddler of uh, Tevye's stories, because in the original, he says he had seven daughters and he has six, and he tells the stories of five, and Fiddler on the Roof ad adapted three. And therefore, I said, okay, they, Tevye and Golde leave uh, Natevka after a pogrom with still two unmarried daughters, where are they going? And of course they're meeting the man from Buenos Aires who is on the train to meet them. And that's where my inspiration came to continue the story of the adaptation that is, was presented by the, uh, the Fiddler on the Roof adaptation. It, and in that way, it was my starting point and from that point on I let the fictionalized story take over and therefore Batya is a daughter on her own. Originally she would have been called Spritze but Spritze was a different character, had a different story than the one I'm creating and maybe because uh, the, the way the stories are developed by Sholom Alechem is the first time in, when Tevye tells him the stories he says I have seven daughters, then he says I have six, and then he tells the stories of five. So I could have called the novel the sixth daughter because that story was never told. But I would have dealt with uh, too many superfluous sisters in the background. The point yes. is I channeled Shalom Aleichem characters and language and the culture, and I was totally fascinated by that. Thank you. I, that's why I wanted to ask you about your formidable research that you did for this novel. You very vividly painted shtetl life and on the road in the pale and the fight for survival. And you painted pictures for us of where they lived and the, the, posse the few possessions they had and how precious they were and how every bit of food was precious. It was just very vivid. And the same thing in Buenos Aires, you really showed us what the, unfortunately brothels culture was and everyday life. So that's what I enjoyed too. It came to life. I could even smell, I could almost smell the smells in the streets and the markets, the homes, the food, the clothes, everything. And um, the preciousness that you painted, you know, Batya had a rag doll from her sister that she brought from Russia that was a, an important possession of hers in the beginning, when she was still a child, when she 
entered this life at age 14. So tell us, uh, tell us about your research. And I know there was a lot more to it in his, the historical research, but let's first, I first wanna ask you about the research you did about everyday life in that period. And then we'll talk about history. The, the part that had to do with the shtetl, shtetl life, I think I've known it from, always known it. It's as if I'd lived there in previous life. It is so part of my literary upbringing because I grew up in Israel. I grew up on that kind of literature. So I didn't even need to research that. I knew, I knew, uh, you may, I, I know the conversation you and I had, we brought up the orange the, that they borrowed. My father was born in Leningrad, not in the Shtetl, but he used to tell me uh, when I was a child how when he was a kid for his birthday and his family was well to do, he got a piece of orange for his birthday, just a slice of orange for his birthday, a section. That was, uh, so the oranges were so precious. So there are some things I've always known. The parts that came there, then there are the other parts, the lie, the, what happened to these women, their entire trafficking, then life in Argentina. And the third part was actually of that was the tango. The part that what happened was Tremendous amount of information I found on the internet in articles about the methods that these traffickers used. What were the brothels like? There was an incredible research done by a French uh, journalist that pu was published in 1928. His name was Albert Lourdes. And he published this scathing report he had ingratiated himself into the into Tzvi Migdal, that's the name of the uh, legal unions of Jews who were traffickers. He ingratiated himself into that them and published this report. It was first published in France, in French, then translated to English in 1928, was published and reviewed in the New York Times. Uh, there were others, there were books that have been written. I had to my available to me PhD dissertation about the traffickers, understanding everything about the history of Jews in Argentina. I was fascinated, totally fascinated by the history of, of uh, Baron Maurice de Hirsch and what he right. had done to, for the Jews in Eastern Europe with his dream of bringing them all to Argentina as the new promised land. That was an incredible vision, incredible initiative on behalf of one person who tried to get the Jews out of Eastern Europe. And that's a story that was not widely known, is that correct? Not at all, actually. And he really, he wasn't that successful. You told me it's a very complicated story and it's that we need another hour to explore that story. So, but so we will not go any further into it. I just want to say that whoever's on the line now and the listeners later, if we ask them, have you ever heard of the Baron Edmund de Rothschild? Of course, they all have heard of Baron Rothschild. If you heard about Theodore Herzl, of course you've heard of Theodore Herzl. But the first one to have that dream was Baron Morris de Hirsch. That did not happen quite that way. But that part of the research was interesting. But then there was a part of the research that had to do with everyday life in Argentina. And I hired researchers. I don't speak Spanish. I needed to know what they ate. I knew they didn't eat cornflakes in milk for breakfast. But what is it that they ate? What did they wear? You can see those, the gauchos outfits, but did people in the city wear those leather pants and did they in those uh, type of striped capes? What did they wear? I needed, I learned about the streets. For example, I know Buenos Aires a bit. I've been there a few times. So if, if Batia walked from point A to point B through cer certain streets, 
had the names been the same names 120 years ago? And there, I had photographs from that time. I asked my researchers to identify those buildings for me because I wasn't sure what they were. So that kind of uh, research I did. And then the final research had to do with tango when I learned that the nascent uh, art of this very special dance developed at that time in the brothels of, of, of Buenos Aires. I had to know more, so I started taking dance lessons and I took almost a year long private tango lessons with instructors to get to understand that, that dance. And I spoke with, I met people who danced it, it, through that. And there was a lot of conversations about the emotions and the romance that they really feel, they can, they fake it, but they really feel it as they fake it. It's just, it was an amazingly fascinating study of how dance gave Batya, I transferred it to Batya, how it gave her self-confidence, how it gave her control over her body and over the man that she danced with and therefore over in a way the illusion of control over her life and uh, how it strengthened her so it says so much to it which i learned and i thought yeah, so now tell us the story of the the connection of tango to your mother and i will then share what we talked about okay i want you to introduce it I struggled from the start before I even started. The minute the voices of these women, the, what I turned out to be probably 150,000 Jewish girls and women victims of Tzvi Migdal, once I realized the enormity of what I stumbled upon, I hesitated because I never said anything bad about Jews or Israel. I never tweeted. I never. I keep away, we have enough enemies to tell bad things about us. But I could not shut down the voices of these women. And actually I sat down to write about the subjugation of women in, uh, in, in Asia during World War II by the Japanese army. That was my original intent. But no matter what I did, came back, I came back to this uh, story. And finally, one day, I, my mother was a very successful artist in Israel. By the, her name was Reviva Yofe, Y-O-F-F-E, -F -E, which is similar to Jaffe. But uh, when they came to uh, Ellis Island, I guess the Jews from Eastern Europe had, had somebody write it with a J instead of the Y. But originally, I guess it was something like Y. At any rate, she she painted magnificent paintings and I have them all over the house and very often when I pass by them I just touch the corner in order to just I feel close to her because I know that her hands were there and one day I passed by this my favorite one that's hung right at the entrance that my mother painted in uh, she was 84 years old at the time and she called it the tango dancer okay Give me a moment. I want to share it with everyone. Let's see if this. Oh, uh, wait a minute. What am I sharing? Do you see it? Not Does yet. everyone see the painting? Oh, I see it. I see it. Does everyone? See? I hope so. Okay. Then okay, everyone. Okay. So does. my mother named this painting the Tango Dancers, and one day as I was passing by it and touching the corner. I realized they were not dancing. Tango dancers would be dancing. Instead, I'm looking at a pimp and a prostitute. And her position here, she pulls away, he's reaching for her. And the way his, you see the way his knuckles are holding on to her shoulder and her head, she's pulling away so hard that the head almost comes off her body. I realized that this is my Batya. I, I, I just couldn't believe the connection. 
And here I was already researching, I was already writing this book, but I felt that with that painting, I got some sort of, um, I, I don't want to say approval, but I thought inspiration to continue to tell the story, to tell this relationship. I'm looking at the dynamics between those two people and to pursue that dynamics. How did he, they meet? How did he enslave her? How does she feel now that she's still sitting with him? And that's uh, my inspiration. My mother's The Tango Dancers by Reviva Yofe. Thank you, that's lovely. And she was a fine painter. So, okay, one more question about history. You have in the story, there's the prosecutor. And the prosecutor offers you know, also a, a way out. She has to put herself at great risk to work with the prosecutor and was trying to bring down Zvi McDowell and specifically, the, which is the name of the organization, and specifically the main character. So, um, and in a parallel to what happens in Buenos Aires in 1984, where um, in, in 1984, just, you, you'll tell us what happened and how it's tied into the fate mm. of that prosecutor, which later on investigated and the prosecutor in the story, who um, also was investigating and had a bad ending. Okay, in 1994, the Amia building, which was the I it was 84, my housed all of the Jewish organizations that were housed in one building, was bombed to the ground. 85 people were killed and 200 were seriously injured, the building was gone. And the Jewish community, of course, expected a prosecution of investigation into the criminals and find out who was behind it. But in every turn, they were stymied and blocked. And there was nothing happening. Finally, in 2015, one particular investigator by the uh, Nissan, the name, his name was yeah. Nissan, finally found everything and he was going to testify that morning about all his findings and pointing out specifically, turns out the president, the female president of Argentina. And a few hours before he was to testify, he was found dead in his hotel room. Like at five o'clock in the morning, he was supposed to testify at nine. And it was devastating, but that was a story that went back all the way over a hundred years before to any attempt to work against Svimigdal or within the corruption of Argentina that continues until today. There are a lot of other unknown questions. In the 18, 19, I'm sorry, 1982 under Perón, there were a lot of people who disappeared and following with another military commander. The, those disappearing, people who had disappeared by the thousands, still the families are getting no answers. So. It is very tough still in Argentina to get answers when there are outright crimes against but The prosecutor in your story is a fictional character, correct? Correct. Who is and working was with Batya and other supporters who were in hiding or undercover. To right, Sergio, Sergio of character who we meet to more to bring them down, and he does not fare well either, unfortunately, in the story. So that there's a parallel I wanted to bring to light. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'd like to um, comment that I enjoyed part one part of the novel, parts sprinkled throughout the novel that I enjoyed was how you exposed hypocrites, both high people, high in society, and low, and how 
the prevalence of hypocrisy. And especially I enjoyed back in Russia, the cobbler's wife, <laughs> who thought she had a very lowly station in life. But when Batya's family needed refuge and someone put them for one night in the home of the cobbler, the cobbler's wife was able to look down on these people as being yeah. beneath her. And she had, at least with Jews, they were Jews too. So I enjoyed that because it paralleled some parts of the story in Argentina where people, you know, were looking, the pe women in the Jewish community would look down on the prostitutes, of course, and not, mm -hmm. didn't allow Batya to sit in the synagogue in the women's section or to pick up one of the books. And um, among the men, we had uh, the irony of uh, Moskowitz, the, the, the evil main character, uh, who's very wealthy and prominent in his illegal trade, being shunned by the regular Jewish community. And he thought he was a very fine man doing good deeds because he gave charity. He used some of the profits to give back, give back through supporting the arts and culture and Jewish life in Argentina, building things. So I kind of those parallels that you had throughout the book. I think you have that tendency in your, I've read all of your novels, by the way. Oh, I recommend you. them all. And I see that in some of the others. You want to comment about which how that works in fiction? It's just a, a nice element of it. You know, the search for respectability is quite common. Even whichever in every every society we see those groups, and it can be in in today's high school. You can see those who are who are dressed in a certain way, look down upon those who do not dress their way. We see that now in a political arena, those who don't think, don't share the, the political view views then they are being looked upon down upon by others because if you don't believe what i believe then you are a low life it is in various forms exists and i guess if, as a student of sociology in my youth it is something that we see in all over and in Judaism, it's interesting because even in our literature, we find that orphans and widows were cases of charity, but they were being looked down upon. They were not, they, they, were, they were being cared for to a degree, but just by the fact that there was no male head of household right then and there, they lost their status. And within the status we see, of course, when you have a yeshiva bucher, that means a, um, a yeah. student in a yeshiva, that would be considered a more like in Jerusalem, my novel Jerusalem Maiden, that would be the highest honor was to marry one, not a merchant. We see that in a variety of ways, and it's always intriguing for me when we go through other social issues to see how norms, social worms are at play within that particular situation, because it makes quite a difference to the main character who may, may be struggling with one thing and but encounters additional hurdles. In the case of uh, the women in the synagogue and the way the Jewish community shunned the prostitutes, especially the women, because women very often are the ones to run charities. And we take so much pride of, in our Jewish charity, yet in Buenos Aires and, and, and Montevideo and Rio de Janeiro, the Jewish charities not only shunned, shunned the prostitutes, who were, we know now were victims of trafficking, but they even forbade by, law, by their bylaws mentioning their cases in their meetings. Yeah. Of course, they did not allow them to be buried in Jewish cemeteries. So Chevat Kadisha, the burial society, would not touch those impure bodies. And, and that was fascinating and heartbreaking. 
at the same time. Uh, so I uh, touched that. I would like to mention that some of the women's behavior, and it appeared in a couple of other places in the book, where the problem was that the, these men's, these Jewish men, women's husbands visited prostitutes. Yes. <laughs> and it was so common. This, it became part of the culture between whether Jewish, Italian, French, Hispanic, didn't matter. It was part of the culture. In the evenings, the men went to the club and the club would be a brothel. They didn't spend as much time necessarily with a prostitute as they played cards and they drank and they did business deals. It was their club. And of course, the women, their wives were left at home. And until today, and, and we see that in not so much in the Jewish society of South America, but in the non-Jewish society of South America, women are being left, mother, I'm sorry, married women are being left home while the men are out with mistresses. It's, it's still very prevalent. It's not something they hide. Okay. Uh, part of the culture. I would like to go back, thank you. I'd like to go back to Batya as your central character. Now she was only 14 when she was enslaved. Um, and throughout the book, she, she grows. She, she begins with certain strengths of character. She retains those strengths and it helps her survive. And you have the stories of some of the other girls who unfortunately did not survive, uh, either through suicide and despair, they didn't make it. But Batya was a little bit stronger. But not only that, but she kind of grew, she kept some of the values, she had to discard some of the values she grew up with, but she kept some of them, especially this fierce loyalty to her family and her, her hope. Now her Spanish name, you'll tell us in a moment, and the parallels there. So hope is a theme, her character, strength of character. And also you have a, a, a thread in the, novel of suicide among those who lived in despair. And she even tried once to, to commit suicide. So how, and I found it really fascinating that one of her lovers, you know, who became her lover, so, well, I'm sorry, he wasn't, this is the only one who was not her lover. He was her partner in other respects, in the tango and in other things. Um, Sergio asked her, why haven't you committed suicide? as though that would be the norm. And she thought to herself, oh, he's the only one who understands what my life is like. So just tell me, I'm speaking a little more, you should be doing the talking, but about her strength of ca her character and how she develops and this tension between despair and hope in your novel. I think that in every novel, what takes the reader through the journey is of course the character and the settings that would be interesting, but it's the moral dilemma that drives a bo the book. A, and a strong moral dilemma is definitely presented here because from the start, she wants to die when this is realizes what happens to her. But at the same time, if eventually when, when she's kind of, she's also very sick at the beginning and tremendous amount of pain and she can't, they, she, there's no way out of a, any of that. But as she heals and Rochel, that's the new friend that she makes, shows her kindness in, it, in, in that misery and we cannot, understand that we from stories on the Holocaust people and the misery of uh, concentration camp and just one gesture of kindness goes so far. It's such an incredible need. And she hung on to it. She hung on to the hand that touched her cheek. She just was so desperate and willing to to do a lot to maintain that warmth that she was getting from, from Rochel. And then meets Netty, who joins there as well. The moral dilemma is kind of begins to find a way that she's willing to take this, rather than kill herself, 
she is willing to sacrifice. She, she has a way that she can still live, sacrificing herself, but has hope to bring her family out of Russia. And that is the moral dilemma that goes throughout the whole book. The second secondary moral dilemma comes later on in the third part when she's so close to her dream where Sergio offers that, but Allman offers something much more concrete. But so between the two men, whom should she trust? She, by that time, her mother has died, and now she can communicate with her mother, believing that her mother is in heaven, watching her, sees what everything that she could never have told her. And that moral dilemma is very strong. And I think that you as a reader did also didn't know what to advise her, if you were there to advise her. I didn't know. I didn't know what she was going to do as I was going through that part of the journey with, with her as well. And that is part of a character as it kept on evolving, building on the strength that she had, but also to a degree saying, okay, I've given it over five years of my life. Nothing is happening. Any prostitute who believes a promise, which is what Sergio is doing, is only promising things that may or may not happen. And we do understand that Sergio begins to also exploit her. He is dragging her along because she becomes a valuable asset of information. And as she suspects it, she finds ways around it and finally gets, she has to find a way around it and make him uh, live up to his promises. So she has to force him. So that all is part of her character. Now back to your question about Esperanza. It's very interesting. I just uh, knew a woman who committed suicide in a neighborhood in the, in the Hamptons, New York, by the name of Esperanza. And uh, so when I was looking for a name, I thought, oh, this came up and I will, I will honor that woman who had died, she had, who had committed suicide, but just, I just honored the name. I didn't know that it meant hope. I, only after when I looked up. The Spanish word for hope, yeah. It meant it came hope. I said, oh my goodness. But it was not my oh. original intention. And it's, which is good. As some things are serendipitous. You, you think the author may have spent 10 hours thinking about it. <laughs> But that was not the case. There were many other things that I, I, I spent time on every word and every sentence and specifically on the dialogue lines so that each one serves a very strong purpose. Okay. And also, in, uh, she had a revelation late in the novel through something that Sergio said to her. He used the term white slavery. And it struck her very strongly. She never, she never framed what was happening and what her life was all about in terms of slavery. She never in her mind. And suddenly she knew there were African black slaves in South, and, in South America, but she never thought it was the sudden shock. It said, I think the words he used, it hit her like a sledgehammer, he used some phrase yeah. Very strongly that that's suddenly, that's what I am. I am a slave. Yeah. In speaking with survivors of trafficking, it came about, yes, that's part of the research, understanding their perceptions and what came out. It's interesting. There was a woman who was already 20, a woman I met, 24 years old, from Costa Rica, spoke English, was uh, working in a bank. She had two children and, uh, and one of her colleagues from the, this bank from, with, with whom she worked for three or four years invited her to come to fly to New York to babysit for the kids of the family while the adults had some celebrations. And she flew in and ended up being trafficked and forced into, uh, by th the kids, her kids were being threatened and she was forced now into prostitution for six years. And when talking with this woman, she originally said when she was rescued finally, 
by an organization. And she kept saying, my friend did this and my friend did that. And I said to you, to her, stop calling her my friend. She was your pimp. She was your, you are her slave. And this woman, she said that it hit her. She had never, she kept thinking of this woman. My friend is, has betrayed me. Not that she was my slave, I'm a slave of this owner, as she was forcing her for six years into prostitution. So this is a concept, also the word trafficking, which we use today was not in existence then. Uh, today we think of, still many people misunderstand the word trafficking as uh, moving people across state lines. That's not it. It is selling people for sex where the money goes to a third party, not the person who gives the sexual services. That is trafficking. Okay, I found the words. I don't want to misquote you. It was on page 283. Yeah, so, so when she- Is so she, the, the words that got you with the force of a gale? Yes, that, when yeah. she's a slave, it was such a, it completely changed her understanding of herself because she was supposed she could walk away she could go out to the market she could go to the bank she could walk they those people are not chained yet they cannot leave there's no place for them to go and that's why they are being enslaved and in russia they had no understanding of the world it's so heartbreaking, the naivete, but it's totally understandable of her parents who thought that, and it's so touching that when she left, he said to the man he thought was a gentleman, please look up my brother in Pittsburgh. Is Buenos Aires near Pittsburgh? He said, a little bit south of Pittsburgh. They had no concept, North America, South America, they were flying blind and it was so heartbreaking. Yes, so, the uh, ignorance of the Jews of Eastern Europe about the geography of the rest of the world was glaring. I found out they didn't know that South America existed until actually Baron Hirsch told them about it. So they thought there was one America. For them, it was usually New York, but they've heard of some other places occasionally because of prior family members or cousins who had traveled. But it was interesting also that, that uh, Batya's mother, Zelda, at the beginning is praising the another daughter of her cousin who moved to Frankfurt. And she can't even say the name Frankfurt. She says Frank something where she married a scholar and she goes, she bathes in the hot springs twice a year. She believes the same stories that Batya eventually realizes that this girl had been trafficked the same way that she had been. Uh, those, they just didn't know because the stories that went back home painted their lives. They could not tell them the truth. It couldn't help them. So they had to paint a beautiful life. And that helped the traffickers continue to hunt for new women. Yeah, the role of the scribes, now the irony also is that Batya did know how to read, though she hid that talent because most of the girls did not know how to read. And she used that talent. She was very wise not to reveal that she had that. That was a secret. Keeping secrets was a source of a little bit of power for her. Mm -hmm. So she was wise in that respect. But um, so uh, just to once more to touch on Baron to Hirsch. For those who are, who are starting the book or halfway through, just be aware that at the end of the book is a wonderful, um, ep is it epilogue? What would you call it? Afterward, yeah, where you epilogue. summarize epilogue. the history of- Oh, no, no, that's an essay. An essay that I okay. wrote, yes. And we, you can learn a lot more about what happened in the wonderful project of that planted the seed for Herzl and what followed of of, colon, of establishing colonies both in rural Argentina and also in Eretz Yisrael, which 
the um, becomes part of the story, which I won't go into. So this is all fascinating. We could go on for a long time, but I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the, some of the work you've done about trafficking today and the work you've done. And I want to also take a moment to introduce that women, what Women's League um, does have involvement in this. And I'd like to ask whether Marlene Oslick is on this call, is on this in this meeting. And if she is, could she unmute herself? Because I don't see her in front of me, but maybe she's not on the call then. We spoke earlier and I thought she would join us. And that's because Marlene Oslick is the chair of Women's League's Resolutions Committee. And she worked with the team and with our leadership to develop uh, one of our resolutions, which is about trafficking that was adopted. And so before I turn back to you. I, there is a Marlene on. Is that Marlene Oslick? Because I unmuted a Marlene. Yes, here I am. Okay, good. Oh, fabulous. Hi, Marlene. Hi. So that was what I wanted to just make our audience aware that Women's League does have a stance on this. And Marlene headed a committee that uh, researched and came to with a, have a resolution and she herself and her life has been involved in uh, firsthand in her community in New Jersey of uh, with some organizations that combat trafficking. And um, then the resolution was adapted by, adopted by Women's League in 2018. I'm gonna read you just a couple of highlights because it's a little long. It's on the Women's League website. Um, so I was going to show you also um, the link where you could find that and before, and then I'll turn it back to Talia. So this is, um, I want everyone to be aware of this and all the other wonderful resolutions where we work with other organizations and we take a stand on these issues. Um, as Jew, background, as Jews, descendants of those who escaped from Egyptian bondage, we are committed to helping combat human trafficking, the modern day slavery. There's two types of human trafficking, sex trafficking, which is defined, and then labor trafficking, which is also defined. Human trafficking is the abhorrent human rights violation and form of exploitation, generating profits in the US of an estimated 150, no, 150 billion worldwide in US dollars. As of 2016, the International Labor Organization reports that there are more than 11 million women and girls and about 9 million men and boys who are victims of forced labor. And of those, between 4 and 5 million were sexually exploited. Approximately 2 million women and girls were trafficked, are trafficked each year, establishing a power dynamic in which they are reduced to chattel. So I'm skipping a lot of this. 20% of runaway children often from foster homes, have been picked up by traffickers. The average age when the process begins is 14, just like Batya. These victims are forced into a life of slavery and torture in a sex industry often related to organized crime. Okay, so this- So I'm just gonna finish up. Um, so Women's League therefore endorses um, the, uh, several economic models to combat trafficking. Um, the worker-driven social responsibility model is one of them. Which one? Uh, it should, you should be aware that in the United States, there's major sporting events like the Super Bowl have major trafficking operations at play during that uh, event. Uh, so therefore, it's resolved that women's, members of Women's League for Conservative Judaism want to educate the public, encourage school personnel to combat trafficking, encourage teenagers to go places in groups, encourage citizens to notify law enforcement and encourage our members to work with projects such as the Polaris Project, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. And there's much more and it's at the, on the website. So I would like um, Talia to tell us, oh, first Marlene, you had a story, you want to tell us something about New what your work was in New Jersey that gave you insight into this? There's an organization in New Jersey that's the Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And it's uh, several 
church-oriented organizations, includes the National Council of Jewish Women, and uh, the police forces, uh, prosecutors, and uh, other uh, law enforcement uh, groups. Uh, we have a problem in New Jersey of uh, almost a constant human trafficking in Atlantic City. But because we were having the Super Bowl um, back the year that uh, we started the coalition here, uh, we were contacted by the Polaris Group in Chicago, who had just uh, completed their work with their Super Bowl, and they wanted to uh, give us advice on how to proceed. Thank you, Marlene. So Talia, before I, before I forget, I want to hold this up. Does everyone see those links? Is that visible? No. No, am I holding it wrong? Yeah, okay, but maybe it's backwards. That's the problem. You might be able to type it in the chat. Okay, I'll do that while Talia's the speaking. I will do that. Talia, tell us more about what you've done worldwide in working with groups and being an advocate. Okay, it, it depends on the issue and different novels of mine deal with different subjects. When it comes to sex trafficking, it is so huge. Uh, first of all, trafficking in general that I focus on sex trafficking and I mostly focus on the what is happening in the US. Two thirds of uh, women who are being trafficked, and again, they are boys and they are trans, but the majority are women, girls and women. Those two thirds have come from, are born elsewhere and one third are born in the United States. So you mentioned the uh, foster care. The foster care system in the United States, huge shame. It is a direct pipeline to prostitution. There is so much sexual abuse and rape in the foster care system that by the time these kids run away at 14, the being, uh, being trafficked is not the worst thing that have happened to them. And the reason they are in a foster care system very often is because they have been molested and raped at home with a variety of issues. So we are talking from mental illness to drug abuse by the parents, a variety of reasons, but the fact is that we can do a much better job protecting our children. They are still in school at 12 to 14, which is the recruitment age in the US of US born. And those of you of the listeners who have been teachers or who are teachers, you know who are the vulnerable students in your classroom and there's a lot to be done. And there are programs like uh, an organization called protectnow.org. It, it operates in California, but it moves into Nevada. It developed a fabulous program from, from fourth grade, from 10 years old, all through high schools. But it also involves teachers, it involves school boards, it involves a protocol, what to do when you suspect this, there's a problem. So that is one area. My bigger picture of all of the issue of sex trafficking is a new paradigm that I would like to start to, uh, I've been introducing since the book came out six months ago, and I'm only at the beginning of the process, because we need to wrap our heads around a new understanding of the sex trafficking business. And we, it is a business, and as you mentioned before, my background is I studied for my master's in economics, and I was always good at statistics and business. There are three parts to, the, to trafficking, sex trafficking. You have the supply, suppliers and demand. The supply will be inexhaustible as long as there's poverty and strife, uh, strife around the globe and there are war and there's misery. The people would want to continue to come to America and they will fall prey, or if they are local, they will fall prey to the traffickers that as long as the punishment is minimal and it's worth taking the risks because of the high profits, they are not going to stop. What we need to focus on is the demand. Let 
there be no mistake. Without the demand, there is no trafficking. There is no business. The demand drives the entire business. And demand, men who buy sex. And as long as we let them off the hook, as long as they, when there's a police raid, the prostitutes are being rounded up and the Johns let go, why not publish all their names? Why are they being spared when they are the ones who mo motivate, who fuel this entire industry? We have to start changing our paradigm of thinking. In, um, in Sweden, the laws uh, claim or assume that all prostitutes, even those who are independent, even those that do not supposedly have pimps, they are still victims. They are victims of psychological damage. They are victims of something. And therefore, according to the Swedish law, every man who pays for sex is a rapist. Now, we are not ready to call all men who buy sex rapists, but very often they are. They're definitely pedophiles when the victims are under 18. But and not all men are consumers of, of sex, even though it's huge business, but they are men who are heavy consumers. They, they consume a lot for over many years and they, they, are, they, they motivate, they drive it. You mentioned Super Bowl as an example. What uh, you have a high demand, and that's when the suppliers fly in and they use airlines. They use uh, they, that's where the transportation is, and the airlines are now more and more becoming involved. And where this is all taking place in hotels. Now you get hotels chains getting involved by developing certain certain guidelines to their own personnel. But in case they don't get it, they, or the hotels don't get it, now they begin some legislations by victims who've been raped for weeks and months in hotels and they, the hotel personnel knew about it. They saw the traffic, they saw the blood, they, they saw the demand for, yeah. for and, and so on. So now they are different uh, cases <coughs> where they brought against specific hotels. The okay, you know, Talia, thank you. We're almost out of time, but I don't want to thank you very much. I think we all have to be aware because it, many times this hidden scourge is in our community, almost in our faces. Yeah, we need to help the victims. So. We need to help the victims as you guys do and, and CNJW do. Very, very important job because to get this, uh, the victims out of prostitution is very important, but we need to deal with the pr project, and that's, that's what I do. You know? Thank you very much for your work. Bef as we wrap up, I do want to ask you, what's next for you? Are you working on another book? Do you have another book in your sights? I know you're doing a lot of talks just like this one, but what is going on in your life and in your authorship life at this time? I'm very lucky that I never need to look for my next novel. They always, the subject finds me way before even I'm ready, hits me on the head. <laughs> and this is another case where I was totally unprepared three years ago, traveling through France when I came across something that uh, reminded me of a story which I have investigated ever since I've been back to France four times. I'm supposed to go again in May, but it doesn't look like I'm going. I have more interviews lined up, but I don't really have time to write this book because I'm on a book tour. I have until, unfortunately, quite a few events are gonna be canceled because they're quite intense. Uh, I may have like sometimes six a week, but there are quite a few are going to be canceled in the couple of, next couple of weeks or three weeks or who knows what the situation going to be. Uh, but um, in between, I spend time to try to write. It does take me about five, six years to write a novel. 
and I do not want a contract with a publisher because I don't want to have to either write a subject that they approve or not approve, nor do I want to be under their time constraints. So I take my time, let the story tell me where it wants to go and in what pace and yes, and my life in between with having a large family, I try to make time for everything. That's wonderful. I thank you so much. You've given well, us just thank a wonderful you so much talk. For giving me the chance. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And I just want to put a date stamp on this. It is March 12th, 2020. Natalia was referring to the uh, virus, coronavirus that is causing cancellation of many events and flights and, and worldwide all over. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, people will that. enjoy this interview for many months to come. So it will be part of our Women's League uh, collection of wonderful author interviews. And we thank you so much for your time, Talia, and all of the wonderful work that you're doing on, uh, and I encourage everyone to read some of her other novels. They're each very special. They, they each delve into uh, an issue that will grip you about women's lives in different, some of them are historic as well, and some are more current. Thank you, Talia. And with that, I think we'll say good evening. Good evening, and thank you all for sharing the book with me. And keep passing the word because I like you all to take with you the humanity of the victims as you take that into action. Thank you. Okay, thank you.